Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Yesterday, we went up to a campground up in the Thumb to visit some family who invited us up for dinner. On the way up there, we listened to the episode titled, Don Quixote Wages a Battle Against a Giant. John said he liked that one, and then last night, as I was putting him to bed, he asked me what I was going to do for the next episode of the podcast. Of course, I replied with, what should I do? He said, you should do another Don Quixote one. I think this one will actually appeal to you, John, since it is the backstory of Don Quixote. So today, we are going to read the story, an introduction to that Spanish gentleman, which was retold by Judge Perry and comes to us from the book, The Junior Classics, Volume 4, Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry. While I was working on this episode, I did have to go look for a book to download for my commute back and forth from work. I did look at the book Don Quixote, and I was blown away. The audiobook is about 40 hours of listening, so that book must be crazy thick or the print is super small. That might be a book that I'd read a chapter or two of a night along with listening to something else. We'll see though. I'll have to try and get my hands on a copy and see how thick it is. Anyway, hopefully you are reading some awesome materials. I did download a book about woolly mammoths and how they are trying to do a Jurassic Park-esque like experiment and bring these extinct animals back to life. I'm definitely excited about this one and hopefully you have some good stuff to read too. Now. Let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Introduction to that Spanish gentleman. Once upon a time, there lived in a certain village in a province of Spain called the Mancha, a gentleman named Quijada or Quesada, whose house was full of old lances, halberds, and other weapons. He was, besides, the owner of an ancient target or shield, a raw boned steed, and a swift greyhound. His food consisted daily of common meats, some lentils on Fridays, and perhaps a roast pigeon for Sunday's dinner. His dress was a black suit with velvet breeches and slippers of the same color, which he kept for holidays, and a suit of homespun which he wore on weekdays. On the purchase of these few things, he spent the small rents that came to him every year. He had in his house a woman servant about forty years old, a niece not yet twenty, and a lad that served him both in field and at home, and could saddle his horse or manage a pruning hook. The master himself was about fifty years old, a strong, hard-featured man with a withered face. He was an early riser and had once been very fond of hunting. But now, for a great portion of the year, he applied himself wholly to reading the old books of knighthood, and this with such keen delight that he forgot all about the pleasures of the chase and neglected all household matters. His mania and folly grew to such a pitch that he sold many acres of his lands to buy books of the exploits and adventures of the knights of old. These he took for true and correct histories, and when his friends, the curate of the village, or Mr. Nicholas, the worthy barber of the town, came to see him, 
he would dispute with them as to which of the knights of romance had done the greatest deeds. So eagerly did he plunge into the reading of these books that he many times spent whole days and nights poring over them, and in the end, through little sleep and much reading, his brain became tired and he fairly lost his wits. His fancy was filled with those things that he read of enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, love, tempests, and other impossible follies, and those romantic tales so firmly took hold of him that he believed no history to be so truthful and sincere as they were. Finally, he was seized with one of the strangest whims that ever madman stumbled on in this world, for it seemed to him right and necessary that he himself should become a knight errant and ride through the world to seek adventures and practice in person all that he had read about the knights of old. Therefore he resolved that he would make a name for himself by revenging the injuries of others and courting all manner of dangers and difficulties, until in the end he should be rewarded for his valor in arms by the crown of some mighty empire. And first of all, he caused certain old rusty arms that belonged to his great-grandfather and had lain for many years neglected and forgotten in a corner of his house to be brought out and well scoured. He fixed them up as well as he could and then saw that they had something wanting, for instead of a proper helmet, they had only a morion or headpiece, like a steel bonnet without any visor. This his industry supplied, for he made a visor for his helmet by patching and pasting certain papers together, and this pasteboard fitted to the morion gave it all the appearance of a real helmet. Then, to make sure that it was strong enough, he out with his sword and gave it a blow or two, and with the very first blow, he spoiled that which had cost him a week to make. To make things better, he placed certain iron bars within it, and feeling sure it was now sound and strong, he did not put it to a second trial. He next examined his horse, who thought he had nothing on him but skin and bone, yet he seemed to him a better steed than Bucephalus, the noble animal that carried Alexander the Great when he went to battle. He spent four days inventing a name for his horse, saying to himself that it was not fit that so famous a knight's horse and so good a beast should want a known name. Therefore, he tried to find a name that should both give people some notion of what he had been before he was the steed of a knight errant, and also what he was now. For, seeing that his lord and master was going to change his calling, it was only right that his horse should have a new name, famous and high-sounding, and worthy of his new position in life. And after having chosen, made up, put aside, and thrown over any number of names as not coming up to his idea, he finally hit upon Rosinante, a name, in his opinion, sublime and well-sounding, expressing in a word what he had been when he was a simple carriage horse and what was expected of him in his new dignity. The name being thus given to his horse, he made up his mind to give himself a name also, and in that thought labored another eight days. Finally, he determined to call himself Don Quixote, and remembering that the great knights of olden time were not satisfied with a mere dry name, but added to it the name of their kingdom or country. So he, like a good knight, added to his own that of his province, and called himself Don Quixote of the Mancha whereby he declared his birthplace and did honor to his country by taking it for his surname. His armor being scoured, his morion transformed into a helmet, his horse named and himself furnished with a new name, he considered that, 
Now he wanted nothing but a lady on whom he might bestow his service and affection. For, he said to himself, remembering what he had read in the books of knightly adventures, if I should buy good hap encounter with some giant, as knights errant ordinarily do, and if I should overthrow him with one blow to the ground, or cut him with a stroke in two halves, or finally overcome and make him yield to me, it would only be right and proper that I should have some lady to whom I might present him. Then would he, entering my sweet lady's presence, say unto her with a humble and submissive voice, Madam, I am the great Caraculiambro, lord of the island called Malindrana, whom the never too much praised knight Don Quixote of the Mancha hath overcome in single combat. He hath commanded me to present myself to your greatness, that it may please your highness to dispose of me according to your liking. You may believe that the heart of the knight danced for joy when he made that grand speech, and he was ever more pleased when he had found out one whom he might call his lady. For they say there lived in the next village to his own a hale, buxom country girl with whom he was sometime in love, though for the matter of that she had never known of it or taken any notice of him whatever. She was called Aldonca Lorenzo, and her he thought fittest to honor as the lady of his fancy. Then he began to search about in his mind for a name that should not vary too much from her own, but should at the same time show people that she was a princess or lady of quality. Thus it was that he called her Dulcinea of Tabasso, a name sufficiently strange, romantic, and musical for the lady of so brave a knight. And now, having taken to himself both armor, horse, and lady fair, he was ready to go forth and seek adventures. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com or you can follow the links in the show notes. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcast or on iTunes and tell a friend. Thank you for your patronage, and as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history. And it's come to a final stop.